welcome to my presentation on filming caves and mines. And um, so I've been filming underground since about 2004 is when I first started. And about five years ago is when I really got into it and started um, kind of fine tuning the, uh, my skills and buying new gear and stuff like that. And uh, so filming underground is a lot different, obviously, than filming above ground. So you have to kind of develop a whole new skill set and there's a lot of challenges. And uh, that's what I'm going to be talking about in this presentation. So there we go. So uh, first of all, you're going to need uh, gear and you don't need really the most expensive gear or um, you know, anything too fancy, but there are certain things that you need. And uh, those items are obviously a camera, lenses, uh, microphones, lights, <sighs> a tripod, and uh, some sort of camera case or Pelican case. And so first we'll talk about the cameras. So the cameras have gotten a lot better in the last few years where pretty much any consumer grade camera is fine for filming and produces a really good image quality. So those cameras are um, classified as uh, DSLRs, mirrorless or cinema cameras. Those are really the ones that are the best in low light. Um, there's also like camcorders and stuff like that, but for a really good uh, image, you'd want one of those, um, one of those three cameras. Uh, the one that I own is the, the C100 cinema camera, which is pictured on the right side of the screen. And really the reason I uh, went with that camera is because that's a dedicated video camera, whereas the other uh, types of cameras are really stills cameras first, and they also shoot video, but they're kind of more geared for shooting stills. So the cinema camera is designed only to shoot video, and it has um, much better interfaces for audio recording and stuff like that. Um, so a few things that you'll need in addition is uh, you'll need a few extra batteries because since it's colder underground, uh, the batteries don't last as long. Um, one tip I have with the camera is to actually wrap it in some gaffer tape to protect it from all the cave mud and grit. And also uh, that will, uh, you could cover buttons and features that you don't need to use underground so you don't accidentally hit them. Um, you'll also need a camera sling with a carabiner. That way you could just unclip the camera from the sling uh, and clip it back on when you need both your hands. And finally, some sort of Pelican case or dry bag to put the camera in when you're going through really wet sections. So all these cameras uh, that I mentioned above all use interchangeable lenses. Uh, they're not like camcorders where the lens is built in. You have the uh, option of using many different types of lenses. And those, those lenses range from ultra wide angle where um, you can see, you know, almost like a fish eye type, um, type field of view to regular wide angles uh, to standard, um, which is pretty much what the eye sees. Uh, that's like a 35 millimeter lens. Uh, then it goes to telephoto, which is a lens that's really zoomed in. And also macro, which is a type of lens that's designed for uh, filming things really up close, like fossils and stuff like that. And within that type of, uh, within those focal lengths, there's two types of lenses. There's uh, primes, which are a fixed focal length, and zooms, which have variable focal lengths. And uh, the other thing you want to know about lenses is that the f-stop is uh, what determines how much light is coming in through the lens. So the lower the f-stop, the more light comes in. And there's no one lens that can do any, everything. Um, they all have their limitations and their strong points. So whenever I'm getting ready to film a cave or a mine, I want to choose a lens that will work well in that situation. Like, for example, if I was uh, filming a, a really huge cave, I would want an ultra wide angle lens so I could take it all in. And I'd want a fast lens, meaning a low, lower f-stop, so it would let more light in, so I don't need to bring as much lighting. But the limitation would be that that lens would have uh, a fairly limited um, amount of different focal lengths, so it would only go um, from, say, an 
ultra wide to a wide, it wouldn't have a standard or telephoto feature. So in that case, I would need to carry a second lens to, uh, to fill those gaps as well. So the cave or the mine really depend, determines which lens you take. And I have a, uh, a nice um, collection of them, as you can see there. So the next uh, most important thing is your uh, mic and the camera's built-in mic is uh, not really a good option for recording dialogue, but it is, it's okay for ambient sounds and stuff like that. To record dialogue, you really need a, uh, a shotgun mic like this that mounts on top of the camera. Uh, and even then that's really just for six feet away or closer. If you're gonna be filming someone talking farther away than that, you'll need a wireless mic, a lavalier mic, which is pictured on the bottom. And that is good because it wirelessly transmits the audio back to the camera so the subject could be any distance away from the camera. And last, the last piece of gear you'll need are some headphones to monitor the sound. So then um, when it comes to lighting, you'll need uh, for, for bigger caves or mines, you'll need a really powerful uh, diffused flashlight and it needs to be diffused and not a spot beam because you wanna light up the whole thing and not create one spot that's overexposed. So the, the more diffused it is, the better. And um, for normal size caves and mines, just a couple of small flashlights uh, like the two that are pictured on the tripods there um, are perfectly fine. But and you want a couple lights so that you could set them up uh, to create a, a well-lit shot. Um, and the tripods come in handy so you could place them in different places and angle them at different features. Um, and then optionally, you have some waterproof lights pictured on the bottom that you can use to light up water features. So the other thing that you'll need uh, is some way to stabilize the, the camera. And you can shoot completely handheld, but that does get kind of tiring on, on longer trips. So it is good to have a tripod that you could put the, the camera on. And in addition, the tripods have, uh, for video, have a fluid head, which means that, that when you um, pan and tilt the head, it's dampened by a liquid inside the, the head so you don't pick up all of, the, all of your shaky and jerky movements when you're panning the camera. It dampens all that and it gives you those really smooth pans and, and tilts. So, um, so even though the, the tripod's kind of heavy and bulky and a pain to, to carry into the cave, it's certainly better than getting um, really shaky handheld footage, which really wouldn't be usable. And plus, I, you could, I can usually find someone to, um, to carry the tripod for me. So uh, it's really not that bad. Okay, so now that you have all the gear, you're gonna prepare for the shoot. And probably the most important thing here is to have a checklist of your gear because every, every cave is different and you're not just bringing all your gear into every cave, you're, you're paring it down to just the bare essentials. And like I said before, you're choosing your lens um, for or lens or lenses for that cave. And you're really trying to bring the, just the bare minimum gear and um, that way, because this could get really, really heavy and bulky and ha to have to carry all that, uh, it could actually inhibit uh, filming it more than it helps. So you want to have your list. You also want to uh, dress warmer than normal because you're going to be stationary for a while while you're um, repeating shots that you didn't get quite right, or uh, you might be just laying in water getting, um, getting some shots. You really wanna just make sure that you're dressed warm enough um, to do that. Another tip um, is to set the white balance on the camera for the lights that you're using. So you wanna make sure that the image isn't too cool or too warm based on the lights, because there is no, um, daylight underground, it's, it's just your lights that you're using, so you want a white balance for those lights. And the other important tip is to be in the right place at the right time. So when you're preparing to go into the cave, you just wanna figure out uh, if you wanna go in, if you wanna have someone go in first and then film them going down, and then you go in next. 
and that way you could film someone else coming in um, rather than being, say, the last person to go in and all you're filming is people's boots as they're crawling through. So you really wanna plan where to be uh, for each scene uh, that you're filming. So here are some guidelines for filming. Um, so once you get in the cave and you, you start shooting, you wanna make sure that um, you're conscious of your composition of your shot. You don't want to put the subject right in the middle of the, uh, of the shot. That's kind of boring. You wanna use uh, the rule of thirds, which is a grid that breaks up the, the screen into uh, three sections vertically and three sections horizontally. You wanna put the subject right on one of those lines, um, typically. And you want to frame it asymmetrically so that you don't have, um, you know, uh, something right in the center. The, um, the other thing you'll want to be conscious of is getting tight, medium, and wide shots. So, so you don't want to just take all the shots at the same focal length, and you, and you certainly don't want to just take shots that um, show the whole cave and people walking through it. You want to really um, choose shots that are showing um, details, you know, tight shots like people's facial expressions, um, medium shots, maybe an interview, someone from the waist up, and wide shots showing the whole cave and maybe people at different distances off, um, you know, in the distance. Uh, another tip is you don't want to zoom your lens while you're filming because it looks kind of unnatural and, and sometimes even a little amateurish if um, you know, you're filming something then all of a sudden you just you zoom in and um, plus there's complications with the focus changing and stuff like that. So you just wanna use your zoom lens as a verifocal, just choose your focal length, frame it and just leave it at that while you're filming uh, the action. And then um, you, know, you could always change the framing for the next shot. And the last tip here is um, to always level your tripod and uh, never just put the camera on a tripod and start shooting because it may look fine um, through the viewfinder, but people might may be at an angle uh, walking. So you want to make sure that your um, bubble level on the, flu on the tripod fluid head uh, has the bubble right in the center so that your shots will be nice and level. So um, what you're filming is actually considered either A-roll or B-roll. So A-roll are the action shots and it's really the footage that tells your story. So that might be someone repelling down into the cave or someone crawling through a really tight passage or going through water, you know, all those parts tell the story. Or maybe you're in a mine and you find a, an amazing artifact uh, and you want to you know, you want to capture that. That's that's what's telling this, your story. And then B-roll are supporting shots that help kind of transition scenes or illustrate a, like a close-up of something. So that's, um, you know, say you're filming someone that found that amazing artifact. Well, maybe you want to also get a really close-up shot of the artifact. So while they're talking about it, you can cut to that to kind of smooth over the transitions in your film. Um, and I have a short clip here that I'll show you that illustrates A roll and B roll. So there A roll was um, Miner Mike walking up the hill looking for the mine and the B roll was what basically his point of view, what he was seeing when he stopped. Sulfide. It's also known as fool's gold. Um, 
not a very important mineral here, and the favorite is their zinc ore. So we're going to follow this tunnel that's right in front of me and follow the vein in the northeast direction, see what we find. So in those shots, you could see how he was talking about the lead ore, and the B-roll was the actual shot of the lead ore to illustrate what he was talking about. So this is one spot where I actually forgot to take B-roll for, I would have liked to take in a shot of the rail and some of the wood that he's showing, but unfortunately I didn't. So you could see how as a, you as a viewer, you probably want to see what he's pointing at, but you can't because I don't have the B-roll in there. So that's why the B-roll is so important. You can see some of the spikes which fasten the rail to the ties still in place. And that's my last example. Um, so you could see how he was talking about something and then I was able to provide a close up of it. So um, you as a, a viewer, you're probably really curious about this thing. You get to actually see it up close. So um, that's the difference between A roll and B roll. And that's um, something that's really important with um, any video uh, production. So the next thing um, that's also very important is audio. And audio is really more than just 50% of your, of your footage because if you don't have good audio, nobody's going to want to sit through um, even the best uh, video footage. If the audio is really just impossible to listen to, it's going to really ruin the effect of your, of your film. So you should um, put as much effort into recording good audio as you do um, recording good footage. And here's a few tips for getting some really good audio. So the first thing that you need to do is always set your audio to manual, because if you leave it on auto, your camera is going to make uh, the decision when it doesn't hear any sound in the quiet cave to, to uh, boost the sound. The, the preamps are going to kick in, and you're going to hear this hiss, because it's going to be trying to find sound where there is no sound. And you're going to have this annoying hiss throughout your entire video, uh, through your entire audio. So, um, oops. Um, also, another tip is uh, you want to turn on the limiter in case there's a really loud noise so it won't clip uh, your, your audio. You want to record at least 30 seconds of ambient sounds um, for, the, for the different um, scenes that you're filming. That way, if someone's talking accidentally or there's an unwanted noise, you can cut that out in post and put in your, your uh, 30 seconds of um, ambient uh, sound recording, so it feels nice and seamless. Um, okay, so once you're ready to get someone to, um, to talk on camera, you need to adjust your audio levels. So you need to get them to say something beforehand. That way you can set your audio so that the levels don't go above zero decibels. So everything should be in the, in the negative range, like negative six decibels. Um, so you also want to determine if you're if someone's going to find something really amazing where they're going to get excited and start talking louder. You may want to um, just 
dial down your, your levels a little bit to prepare for that. So uh, you do need to adjust the, the audio um, for each uh, shot, basically. So the other thing is you need to make sure that no one is um, talking in the background when you're recording audio because that you can't take out in post. So if you're doing an interview and there's the mic may actually pick up noises behind you, people talking, you just want to make sure that doesn't happen because that could end up ruining a, ruining a really good dialogue. Um, another thing that's, that's really important uh, that I'll illustrate uh, with, a, with another video is you need to keep the mic about six feet away from the subject, no, really no further than that, because in these caves, there's a lot of uh, room ambience, which is the echo that you, that you hear when you're in a big cave. And if the mic is farther away than about six feet, you're gonna pick up too much of that ambience and it's gonna be, the dialogue is gonna be really hard to listen to. So you wanna get that mic as close as you can to the, to the subject. And if you can't get it that close, you'll need to use a wireless lavalier microphone. And that way the, the person could be as far as they want from you and it'll still pick up really good audio because that microphone will be actually clipped to their clothing. So to illustrate that, I'll show you this video with the microphone um, in a couple different positions. When I was a kid, he used to play in these holes out in the backyard. And my grandpa, I, I thought there were caves. My grandfather told me there were mines. He says, if you go into, in the mines, there's a city, an underground city underneath there. Welcome! So this, this clip has uh, my on-camera mic placed about six feet away from the subject. And you could hear there's some minor room ambience, like a little bit of echo, but it's not, uh, it's not annoying. It's, it, it helps to kind of give you a feel for where they are. They're in a really huge mine. And you could tell that with their, with their audio. It doesn't sound like it was recorded in a studio. So with this video, I, was, I, I went back farther than the six feet um, with my camera and mic. And I wanted to show a little bit of a bigger space. And I wanted to get more room ambience here. And so I kind of bro broke my own rule of six feet away, thinking that the, the, the ambience will sound like a huge cave, which it is. And uh, it ended up not, qu not quite um, being as good as I, I wanted it to be. It's a little bit too echoey. But luckily, it was just a short clip, so it, it worked in that film. But I wouldn't want to record an entire dialogue with that much uh, room ambience and that much echo. It just, you wouldn't be able to listen to that uh, for very long. So in this case, what I should have done is um, probably just used a, um, a lavalier mic. And then I would have been able to record uh, some really clean audio without so much of an echo. Or I could have moved in closer, but then I would lose a little bit of the um, the cave. They're really following the, the top of the vein all the way up, all the way up there. And you can see there's a, uh, there's a hole in the wall up there where the stope continues. So that last video was taken with a, la a wireless lavalier mic and uh, minor Mike here has that clip to his clothing. And I use that because we're in boats, in separate boats, and I wasn't able to get six feet from him. Uh, and it, this is a huge iron mine. So the echo would have been unbearable. You wouldn't have heard anything. So the wireless mic worked perfectly there. And you still get a little bit of that room ambience. I would have liked maybe a, a little bit more just so it doesn't uh, feel so, um, so much like a studio. Uh, but at least you can kind of still tell he's in a large space and the audio is, is really clean. So that's why a um, wireless lavalier mic is um, really handy. So another um, aspect of filming is lighting. And um, there's a few tips that I have for, for lighting the cave. Um, first of all, you don't really want to just have an on-camera light or um, a light just uh, a headlamp or anything like that just shining on your subject because that's going to be really flat lighting and you're not going to it's the the image isn't going to look three-dimensional it's just going to um, kind of look boring and it might even overexpose the subject 
um, if you have the light directly on them and you wouldn't see any of the background. So in order to really light um, these caves, you need to use a few tricks. And um, the main trick is just backlighting people. So you wanna always have a, la a light um, behind people so that they become kind of a silhouette or so that there's a halo around them that separates them from the background. Um, another trick is to just tilt the headlamp down a little bit so the person's face is illuminated. So you could see Mark here is walking through the water and he has two headlamps and his backup lamp is on and his uh, main lamp is facing down on his face so you could see his, his face clearly. So you also want to place the lights uh, off axis from the camera so that they're at like an extreme angle and that will um, kind of highlight details in the wall and stuff like that. Uh, you only really want to use the, the camera on the, the light mounted to the camera if there's no other option, like if you're walking and following someone and um, you, know, you can't really set up lights if you're just walking uh, behind someone, then you're forced to use the on-camera light. But also that doesn't mean you can't give lights to the other people that they can hold so that they become silhouettes. So you just need to get a little creative with it. And I have a video here to illustrate um, a few different types of, of lighting that I use. So you can see in this one, this is a, a light that's uh, backlighting Steve and it's at an extreme angle to the wall. So it, it highlights all of these nooks and crannies in the wall. If I had just a, a light mounted on the camera, you wouldn't see any of that, it would just, appear like a smooth wall. And here's an example where I'm using backlighting, but I'm also using fill lighting in the foreground. Uh, if I had just the backlighting, you wouldn't see any of this in the foreground with the, the rock and the timbers. Uh, but if I had just, um, just lighting in the front, you would not see uh, minor mic standing up there. So this is a case where you need to use um, pretty much all the lights at your disposal. And this is another case where I used fill light just to get this, um, this prop in the, in the foreground just to, to tell you that you're in a mine, in, in an old mine, and then Steve is uh, using backlighting to silhouette himself walking down the tunnel. This is a shot with some natural lighting and uh, I fill, light, fill lit this so that minor mic would be uh, lit up here. If I didn't do that, he would just be a complete silhouette in this shot. And sometimes you, you just want a silhouette because it looks really mysterious. And this is one case where we were going into a really big cement mine and I thought he actually looked um, better as a silhouette. It just looked a little bit more mysterious as we were entering the mine. And you could also light up water by backlighting it. So you wouldn't really even see this dripping water if you didn't backlight it. It would just kind of blend in with the surroundings. This is another shot where the, the lights are held at an extreme angle to the, to the object uh, in the frame to highlight all of the nooks and crannies. If you had like, a light just shining on it from the front, you wouldn't see all of that. And this is an example where I'm using some of the underwater lights to create like a, a nice glow. Um, so Mark is standing in the water with two underwater lights to create a glow so you can see all the details on his jacket. He has his headlamp facing down so you can see his face and he's also backlit. Um, with a light shining uh, behind him to illuminate the, the cave behind him. And then this shot here is actually just using the lights that the people are holding, but I'm shooting it with a really fast lens. So in other words, a lens with a very low f-stop, one that lets a lot of light in so that we could just use the, the natural light from their headlamps and it still looks pretty good. I didn't have to use any extra uh, lighting to get this 
particular shot. Okay, so those were some examples of how I light the mines and caves. So then once you've gotten all your shots, um, you can edit together your film. And this is where you'll be really happy that you got all of the boring and mundane shots like, um, you know, gearing up before you go into the cave, um, crawling through tight tunnels where you don't really want to take your your camera out because you don't want to get it wet. Well, you'll, you need all those shots in order to tell a, a compelling story. So as long as you got all of those shots and also got B-roll to transition and to illustrate um, close-ups, you can put all of your shots into the editing um, program and uh, start creating your film. And you'll want to use your B-roll to help with the transitions. So you'll, you'll put those in. Um, you want to add some music to create an atmosphere to kind of get your viewers in the in the mood um, to create a, a feel for your film. Um, you'll, you may want to use some of the audio tracks that you recorded to fix some audio problems, maybe where someone was talking where you didn't want them to. Because um, also sometimes you do need to, when you're filming, you do need to talk and give direction and tell people like go left or go right or keep coming towards me. And that's fine because you can cut out that that audio and put in some ambient audio and it won't look like anyone speaking and your subjects are doing kind of what you want them to do um, while you're filming them. And then finally, you could add a narration if you wanna um, you know, tell the story in your own words. And when I'm, when I'm writing a narration, I always write it in present tense because I want people to, to feel like they're there with me on these trips. I don't wanna tell them about something I did. I want them to take, I wanna take them along on these journeys and um, hopefully um, you can too with, with your own, um, uh, if you, if you want to get started with filming, I, I uh, encourage you to do that. And I think it's a great way of, of sharing your, uh, your adventures with other people. And so if there's any questions, um, I could take those. For any one cave trip, how long does it take you to actually edit to the final product? Oh yeah, so that's a really good question. So. Um, it, uh, I'm getting a lot faster at it. So usually when I'm creating like a, a, a full episode, like a Minds and Mysteries episode where it's, um, you know, 25 minutes long, usually it takes me like one day to write and one day to edit. So when, I'm, when I have the footage, I'm, I'm kind of, because it's not just one cave in each episode or mine, or yeah, sometimes it is, but um, for something short, like a Caves and Legends episode that's like 10 minutes, I could do that in... Um, less than one day. Have you ever used B-roll from a different cave and put it in another cave's movie? That, uh, probably, hey, hey, yeah. Those I, are I, secrets. Probably, I probably have, but I, I, did, I did so with, with discretion. And it was probably <laughs> something, like, I, I always like when people wear kind of the same clothes for every shoot, because if I'm missing something, like I talked about how you know, if you're missing something, your 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 movie's not going to make any sense. So I I may have grabbed a, a shot of some other uh, from some other footage, but not not on a regular basis. That's that's funny. I feel like every time I watch a movie now, I'm going to be like, that's a roll and that's b roll. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Yeah, All, like even Hollywood movies, everything follows this pattern. I mean, storytelling. There's not a lot of different ways to tell a story, so it all pretty much follows the same pattern. Hey Mike, what's your secret uh, for easy access to equipment? Because you, obviously you'll be going through tough parts of the cave, you want things protected, and then you want to get it back out again, but you don't want to spend a lot of time. So you, um, your question is, is protecting the gear? Yeah, yeah, and having easy access when you're ready to use it again. Oh yeah, um, well I like uh, Storm Cases. So it's a it's a company that I think Pelican Case owns that company. So they're a little bit lighter weight than Storm Cases, uh, or they're a little bit lighter weight than Pelican Cases. So I just like being able to open up that case and everything's right there. Um, there's also these good um, there's like these little white drums. I think they're called like Darren drums or something. Um, that's really good. Like I like the hard cases. I don't. I don't like putting everything in a camera bag and then putting it into a, a, um, a dry bag because then you have to unroll everything. It's just so nice to open a case and you have all your 
your lenses and all your gear right there. So I like to, I like storm cases. Mike, I'm going in for, you know, with your camera and your tripod and, you know, everything else. 30 pounds? No, it's lighter than that. Um, Is it? Yeah. Well, the tripod, usually someone else will carry for me. So, <laughs> I'm, yeah, and even the, the camera gear, yeah, it's, I, I, try, I really do try to pare everything down to the bare minimum, like even my camera, like I, I take the handle off it even. So, I mean, just to, just to save that much weight and, and space in the camera case, anything I can pare down, I'm like cutting it down to the bare essential. So I should weigh it sometime, but no, it's, it's lighter than that. That would be almost impossible in, in to pull 30 pounds through these like, passageways. I would need porters to help me with that. Uh, but um, yeah, I, should, I will weigh it sometime and see. Mike, he always carries more than his Sherpas. He likes to carry the bulk of it himself. Yeah, I, I do usually carry most of myself because it's also if if I dr you know if I drop and break something, at least it's my fault and nobody else feels bad about dropping a a camera case down a a hole. So yeah, yeah usually I hold on to the camera, but the tripod I'm always willing to to let other people carry that. So um, if we're ever on a on a caving trip, always um, I would always appreciate if someone volunteers to carry the the tripod. Does that tripod have a level on it? Yeah, it has um, it has a level on the um, the the head has like um, kind of like a ball mount, so you just you you just set the um, the legs any way you want, and you you sometimes have to get creative with that. Like you could even span a a gully with it. It doesn't matter as long as you get the the legs positioned securely. You could just loosen up the head and the, the head positions on a ball, and then you just get the level um, set on the head and lock it down, and then it's a hundred percent level. Hey, Mike. This is Steve Jurewski. How do you choose your subject matter? It's uh, it's got to be something that inter it's got to be something that interests me because I'm I'm doing all this because I, I love doing it first and foremost. So um, one one thing that I didn't really mention is that um, when I'm when I'm filming, some people might think like, oh, you know, filming it's it's um it's taking away like from your experience. You're you have all these things to do, but I think it's just the opposite. When I'm filming a cave or mine, I'm actually looking at things more closely, and I'm spending more time in the cave or mine because I'm filming, and I feel like I'm getting more from the experience. So um, I don't know. I mean, I'll really just I'll film anything, even even things that aren't. Um, considered big caves, but maybe they have a really interesting story. That's fine. For me, it's all about the story. Um, you know, I, 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 wanna, I wanna bring these places back to life by telling these, these obscure, obscure stories. So even if it's a little tiny hole in the ground, that's, that's fine with me. Mike, have you found it hard to not get mud and dirt and stuff on your cameras? I don't, I don't remember seeing like, if you have like separate pairs of gloves, like how do you maintain clean equipment? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that is a really good question. Yeah, I always, I always bring a few pairs of gloves and I'll take the gloves off when I'm using the camera. If I have to, you know, like change the audio and stuff, I'll just take my gloves off and then now I have clean hands for, you know, setting, um, doing settings and stuff. Um, but it, do, it in, inevitably it gets muddy and um, that's okay because the, the professional cameras are designed to be like moisture resistant and stuff. It's really just the the cheaper cameras that just break like my when I first got into it like these these consumer camcorders that you'd buy at like Walmart they would just they wouldn't last but I've never had a any of my professional gear I've never had one single problem with it getting wet or muddy I never had a single issue um it's just like the cheaper stuff like the the less expenses expensive lenses sometimes they'll you lose communication to the camera body um so I guess that's a good reason for having really good gear. Mike, can you just like knock on wood for a second? <laughs> <laughs> just to keep the yeah, trend I know, going. I know. I know. I mean, it's not, to me, um, I, I would never hesitate to, to take any of the gear um, to these places because to me, this, this is my hobby. This is what I enjoy doing. If I was to take really cheap, junky gear um, into a cave, I don't think I would enjoy that much. I want to have nice cameras and if they get wet or muddy 
or even, you know, if something goes wrong, I mean, that's all part of the fun. I'll just send it off to have it repaired and, you know, just keep, keep doing that. And I'm always looking at the, the newest cameras. So, uh, you know, I'm getting a new, a brand new camera every couple of years uh, anyway. So, you know, if, if I took the same camera into these funny situations for like 10 straight years, uh, I don't think it would last in that case. But every couple of years, it's, um, it's nice to get a new camera. What's the camera cost? Uh, they can be pricey. I just purchased, so there's a, a brand new cinema camera that uh, has just come out. Actually, it hasn't even been released yet. I'm still waiting for it to ship. And that was uh, $5,600 plus $600 for a, for a speed booster, which is a like an adapter to use the lenses that I currently have so I don't have to buy all new lenses. What's next on your agenda? Well, I'm going to- Plans for filming. Going, uh, put together another Minds and Mysteries episode. And uh, it's it, sometimes it's tough to think of um, kind of like linking factors that can, uh, like some of, the, some of the footage, there's just not enough on it to make an entire 25 minute episode about. So uh, the cave that, or the mine that we just recently discovered that we sent the ROV down, I wanna make that into a Minds and Mysteries episode, but I'm trying to think of my angle for using that with some other footage that I have that I haven't been able to put into a full episode. So um, I think the, the angle there on, on the next Minds and Mysteries episode will be mines that, um, colonial American mines that have a record of being purchased from the, the Native Americans. So like what mines are out there that have a deed that says this land that contained either a black lead mine or a copper mine was purchased off this Native American and it even has a signature from that Native American on that deed. And these signatures are really interesting and, and intricate. And there's only three that I can think of that, that have history going all the way back to being purchased from a Native American as a, as a mine. And uh, the copper mine that we just discovered may be one of them, but I'm still doing the research on that. So I think that might be kind of the premise for the next Minds and Mysteries episode. Um, or I might just change it and make it like, okay, copper mines of Connecticut and then put a few more copper mines in. But I'm trying to always just think of these new angles um, other than just, you know, the type of mine, you know, some of the history. So mm -hmm. I, that's what I'm working on next. That's great. How do you deal with fog on your lens? Do you use any coating or oh, yeah. just let it be? Uh, no, there's, um, there are like anti-fog wipes and stuff, stuff like Zeiss, like the lens, um, this really high-end lens manufacturer sells stuff like that. And none of that really works um, well. So that's why uh, we just film the, the cave in reverse. When, when, it, when you go in and the lens is fogged up, you just have to wait for it to unfog. There's really no, uh, I don't have any tricks to, to make it immediately unfog other than just taking in a cheaper lens but has less glass and so there's less there's less glass to for moisture to condense on so sometimes just having like that cheap lens to, to throw on the camera while your good lens is um acclimating mm -hmm. that's really all you can do or just film the cave in reverse like go all the way in and then film it going out like you're going in <laughs> which we've done before these cameras and everything else and all your travel cost a lot of money do you actually make any money off your videos? No, not really. <laughs> I, and I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to, it's, it's pure, it's a pure hobby for me. Um, one time I did sell a clip to someone who's making a movie, like a clip of just walking through a, uh, a tunnel for like 200 bucks because he needed a, a point of view shot for like the detective who was going into a, a mine. But um, that was really it. It's, um, it's, it's purely a non, um, non-profit thing. I'm just doing it because I, I love doing it. And um, yeah, I, if, um, I mean, people can certainly like donate money to, to my, uh, I think I have a GoFundMe <laughs> or, some, or some one of those, but uh, um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's just pretty much a hobby for now. Didn't you just get an honorable mention or something at the NSS? Yes. Yeah, no, that's, that's always rewarding. I do want to, like, I do, I do like getting um, awards and stuff. Tell all my friends to watch it, the, uh, Ball's Cave. That <laughs> is a classic. That's, I, I love that's it. Amazing it is. And like, you know, this much airspace, <laughs> they never go. 
it's tricky to um, to do something that you're a, a little where you're a little bit scared and, and apprehensive, but also try to film and get usable footage at the same time. So going through the flooded part, I was really just like blinding myself with my um, to get enough light for the GoPro so that it would be I was mostly just worried about getting usable footage. <laughs> but yeah, that was really that was really fun. That was that was a tough trip. Like I as I was helping him. And I, I just couldn't stop shivering. I had to leave. And I was like, all right, Mike, I know he would have kept, he would have kept going for who knows how long, but I, you know, the people doing it were getting cold. It's a cold, wet cave. Mm. Is there any equipment on your one that was like, I wanted to get all the shots since we were down there, but yeah, it was, it yeah. was pretty to come. I don't know. You, you had adrenaline. Like you went through the lost passage. Yeah. I didn't even go. We, we sent him alone for his first time. Like, <laughs> you don't come back and we have your gear <laughs> he, le he, he learned about that uh, the right hand turn all by himself yeah that's, oh, <laughs> bought, nobody warned him no <laughs> it's even in the video keep going saying, and it sums I, out. I didn't yeah. know the way out it was uh, I, I even had that in there um, that was, but yeah that was exciting I have a question. Um, how much have you had any of your gear destroyed by being in a cave? Tell us your best story of gear being destroyed. <laughs> um, that hoe that we left in Middletown? Yeah. Well, that's not destroyed. He didn't, he didn't like her anyway. Um, <laughs> honestly, nothing's ever been destroyed. We even like, we, we, we blasted stuff with the cameras filming it and thinking that it was going to get blown up and it never, the only thing that ever got destroyed was cheap camcorders that would get, get moisture and then just die. No, I, nothing has ever been destroyed that I can think of. That's impressive. <laughs> <laughs> no, Mike, I think your presentation was great. It was very well thought out and I didn't realize how much goes into filming. It's, I mean, there's so much to take into consideration, the lighting and the setting up, and it's, you do a really good job. Yeah, there, there is a lot to it, and it's, um, you just want it to be as, as much like muscle memory as possible, because when you're in a situation, like if you're finding a new mine that you've never been in, I mean, there's so many things to worry about besides filming, but you want to, that's where you want to film, that's where you want to get the good footage is when you're discovering something new. So you just got to just keep doing it like as much as you p possibly can so that you just become second nature. And then when you get the opportunity to find a new mine or cave, something completely undiscovered, you can just film it and not, you know, worry so much about getting everything um, done properly. It's just like second nature. All right. So you just calm cool. down. You just calm down right now. You're getting really excited there about the kind of caving and filming and mines. <laughs> you have to turn down the dial on the audio. To yep, <laughs> I know. We actually, I think when um, me and Michael Gerard filmed the uh, the new mine I found, we there's some clips where we were doing that. Remember, Mike? We were like, um, we were just testing the audio by, by saying like, "Okay, oh my God, we're excited, we're excited," and I was adjusting the levels. <laughs> you know what I was <laughs> thinking when we were doing that? Find. What? If we're pretending to get excited, but I was thinking to myself, you know what? When we really get excited, we're probably going to be even louder. <laughs> you know, I think we're, I always worry we're underestimating. I worry yeah. about that too, actually. I, I never want to have us get to the, the level of excitement where we're actually clipping like the audio. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So, so always when, before we're about to find something really amazing, make sure to, to, mock get excited so that we don't um, <laughs> record uh, the audio wrong. That's the number one rule. I just want to mention actually when we were filming this, I, I want to uh, say that the one thing that's great about working with Mike and this is he thinks forward about um, safety too because in this uh, particular one there was a passage that had to be dug out uh, that had actually collapsed again. <laughs> so to be smart, he actually thought ahead and I was ready to just go over, drop it in, and start uh, working it from there. But he said, well, hold on. Why don't we put it over there, and we'll ROV it from the other side where we'll be safe, where both of us can stay. So it's really good to uh, the fact that he thinks out ways to make sure that 
everyone involved in it is going to be safe and we have some kind of plan in case something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mine collapses are a real thing. It's not a situation where the mine itself collapses. It's just the the loose dirt and rock that's built up in the in the shaft would would collapse and we'd have to dig through it, which is difficult. Um, so you you definitely don't want to have both people on this on the the wrong side of that in case you have to dig someone out. <laughs> it, it somehow is reminded me of the when you were digging out mass hole in like the shoring that went up in there. Like I look back on that now and I'm like, I shouldn't have been in there. That's crazy. That was a death trap. <laughs> yeah, it was. It's still is. Mike, off the beat, um, what experience do you have with GoPro and what, uh, what tips can you give with a GoPro? Most of us can't afford ten thousand dollar equipment, so. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and oh, yeah. Just to just to reiterate, yeah, you don't um, you don't need the most expensive camera. Like pretty much any consumer grade DSLR, like the a stills camera, shoots really good video. Um, so, like all this stuff is within the reach of of you know anybody to just start. But um, the GoPros, I, yeah, I, I always bring a GoPro if there's going to be water or something where I don't want to risk my good camera. And the main thing is just make sure you have enough diffused light because they're, they're not really that great in low light. So I just want to make sure I have like the most diffused light possible because um, they, they don't have um, like a lot of stops of dynamic range. So like the highlights always get like overexposed on them. So the more diffused the light is, I guess the better. That's the, the main tip I could uh, I can provide. But I, I do, I always bring the GoPro in addition to my camera because you, you need, the most important thing is to get all the footage to tell the story. It's not necessarily getting, you know, really high quality footage all the time. Like if there's something that you need to, uh, some footage that you need to get with water and you don't want to bring your camera in there, well, you better have, um, you know, another camera that you could bring in like a GoPro. Otherwise that whole section will be missing from your film. If you could do a video over, would you do it over or would you rather keep to the first take of like surprise? Probably, oh, that's such a good question. Um, probably the first take is the best. I, I don't know. I want to redo our uh, the sunk vi our sunk mine video, and I'm I'm really afraid that it's not going to come out as as good as the first one. So, I don't know. I would say the first take is always the best, even if the quality of the footage and and just just something about the um, like the dynamics and the just the yeah, is all is always the best on the fur the fur, and that's also a good, a, even stronger reason to um, do a really good job filming all the time because you never know if you're going to get a second chance to, and it's hard to also fake excitement when you have to come back and see something again that you've already seen. So, yeah, I think Mike, I think the the first is always the best. You can never really replicate it. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Mike, what what? was your most adventurous or or the one that um, you are most apprehensive doing? Um, well, the, the one we just did where we, where we repelled down into rafts, I was pretty apprehensive about that because I, you know, if you, if I pop the raft, the, we'd have to like swim out the, the, you know, I had the camera, I had a case for it. So I knew I could put it in there, but um, that was kind of, that I was, I was very apprehensive about that one because I also tried to go um, and do that years ago. And I, I didn't feel like I could get in the raft properly. And now the second time, which was just a few months ago, I had some two really skilled people with me. So I felt, you know, safe. And I felt like I could, we could do it, but um, yeah, that, that was probably the, that was the, um, the one where we repelled down into the rafts. That's probably the one I felt like a lot of apprehension on um, just, you know, do it, being able to do that and film it at the same time. But also anything where we're digging open something new and going in is always a little scary. All right. Anybody else have anything to add? Thanks for coming. Bye. All right. Thank, Thank you, you, everyone. Bye, Bye guys.